Hello and welcome back to Russ's Movie Corner. My name is Russ and as you can see, I'm sitting in front of my movie corner. I have my Armor of God t-shirt on, my Son of God movie right next to me. And judging by the frame around me, we are back taking down Christy Burke and her video, Six Times Jesus Wasn't All Peace and Love. Now in the last one, we spent a lot of time talking about um, Jesus' ministry and kind of what... Um, kind of what he did in relation to non-believers, that is, non-believing Gentiles, non-Jewish Gentiles, okay, who actually did get healed by Jesus. Um, and one last thing that I want to say on this point, and then we'll move on, is when Jesus was talking to the woman, okay, the Syrophoenician woman in Mark, he wasn't necessarily and this is something that I've mentioned numerous times, he wasn't calling her a dog, okay? He was using an analogy, and basically the analogy was this. If you, let's say you, sitting there right now, if you had kids, okay, and you had a dog that was starving, would you take food away from your kids to feed the dogs? That's basically what Jesus' analogy was, okay? It was, are you going to take bread from a ch from the children's table okay and you're going to give it to the dogs and she understood the Seraphonician woman understood and she said ah yes i understand where you're going with this but even the dogs will eat the crumbs that fall from the kids table okay jesus was testing her faith as i said in the last two parts of this series okay he was testing her faith because there were a lot of people that were testing Jesus' faith. Now, one of the probably the most famous example of a person testing Jesus' faith is probably not what you're thinking of. It's the second it's the second thief on the cross. Right? Jesus was crucified between two thieves. Okay? And the first thief turns to Jesus and is like, Hey, you there, if you are that Messiah figure. Get yourself down off of that cross. And while you're at it, save us too. But the other thief was like, don't you get it? This, like, you and I, we deserve this for what we've done. But him? Uh-uh. He don't deserve this. Okay? And that's the point of all of this. <laughs> okay? is that most people don't really understand okay that that's what's going on yeah here it is um Luke 23:39 through 43 one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done no wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The, th the second thief got it. The first thief was like, he was like the Roman soldiers that mocked Jesus. Hey, if you're God, come on down off that cross. The, the second thief was saying the same thing, okay? Hey, you there, if you really are the Messiah, get down off that cross, and while you're at it, save us too. Okay? He, he didn't want to die. He knew he was going to, but he didn't want to. And he was thinking, hey, Jesus... Jesus Christ, fellow, if you are this Christ Messiah figure, save yourself. And while you're at it, save us too. He was just looking for a miracle like everyone else. Okay? But that's not what Jesus was there for. Because again, Jesus clearly stated, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. He was there to solve the problems he was there to fix the sinners, not the healthy. But he was also there to call out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. 
Now, <coughs> let's jump back in and let's see where she goes. Next up is in Matthew 10, starting in verse 34. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus literally says, do not suppose I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Yes. Yes. The, the word of God is called that the reason why... Okay. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay. And so ask yourself this question, Christy. When you left Christianity, did your parents embrace you and say, Oh, you're doing so well. Good job. Get out. You know? Or was it get out? Did did they did they hug you and embrace you? Okay? Or did they cry? when you walked away. Now, I'm not saying that your parents don't still love you. They do. But obviously, you're here making videos like this, okay, where you're bad-mouthing Jesus and you're trying to pervert the Word of God to say things that it doesn't say. Or to take things out of context and then say, Well, see, Jesus said he never sought to bring peace. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. And you'd know that if you'd actually read the Bible. Okay? It's pretty clear. Now, one of the biggest problems is, is that here again, okay, Jesus is talking to his disciples in this passage in, Ma in, in Matthew chapter 10. Okay? In the first part, okay, basically 1 through 4, he calls to him his 12 disciples. And those being Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew's brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Okay? Then, in the very next verse, verse 5, he says, Go nowhere among the Gentiles. He sends them out to Israel. He says, Don't go out to the, to the Gentiles just yet, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. So basically what he's saying is, I did not have you pay me to, to receive the gift of life, the eternal life that I've given you. So too should you not take any money from people whom you heal. This flies in the face of people like Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Stephen Furtick, Todd White, Mike Todd. You got it yet? Kenneth Copeland. Jesus is saying, don't demand payment for services rendered. Okay? If people want to donate to you. That's fine. Okay, but he says, you received without paying, give without pay. What that means is, is that when they perform these miracles of heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, don't demand payment for it. it says, acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals, or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. 
Whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it. Stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And funny enough, she missed this. Paul did this. <coughs> okay, Paul and Barnabas and, and Silas and all them. They did that. Okay, they totally did that. All right. Then, after he gives them their their charge, okay, to send them out, he says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governments or kings for my sake. To bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious about how you are to speak, or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. That is, God the Father. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. You see what happens when you cherry pick and you take things out of context. The context of the next two passages are right there. In verse 21, okay, and 22. Brother will deliver brother over to death and father again and the father his child and the children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns in Israel, of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, a servant, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house of Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. This is verse 28. Okay. So have no fear of them. Sorry, 26. So have no fear of them. Nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the, on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are numbered, are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. Now, here comes the passage that she just read. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemy will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, here's the kicker. The end of the passage. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. The passage is not talking about... The passage is not sitting there talking about Jesus saying, Hey, guess what, everybody? I've come to just sow division, and that's it. Ha ha ha. No. He's saying that his words will cause consternation on earth. Okay? The words he proposes will go against what society says. Okay? Because you are going to have friction in your life. You are going to have 
people do things in your life. Okay? And that's why I asked Christy, was your parents, when you told them, I'm done with Christianity, I've deconstructed my faith and I'm done, were they like, yay, congratulations? Or were they crying and going, why did you do that? Because if so, you're literally doing what Jesus what Jesus said. Okay? Because you don't believe in his word. I'm assuming your parents do, considering that you said that you were a Christian. Okay? And so that's causing friction over Jesus' words. I mean, honestly, who among you could sit there and not see that and go, Oh, I get it now. Because he's talking about his disciples. And there are other places where the disciples, like just a few short chapters later, okay, um, when, the, uh, when the rich young ruler comes to visit Jesus, okay, it's, um, let me see here. It's, um... Yeah, it's um, in, in Matthew 19, okay, it says, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus is teaching his disciples there that he's like, hey, you need to understand that if you've done all of this stuff, because you're following me, you're following God, you will have eternal life and you will have more than you could have ever dreamed. It's not saying that you have to hate your father or your mother or whatever. It's if you're putting family obligations before God, if you're putting work before God, if you're putting all of that stuff before Jesus, before God, you're not putting God first. God should be at the forefront of everything you do in life. That is something that Jesus clearly taught throughout the whole entire Gospels. And it is something that Paul taught throughout all of his epistles. It's something that Peter taught in his two epistles. Something that John taught in his in, in, in first John. You have to understand what Jesus is talking about. God first everything else you cannot serve two masters okay some translations say you know he says you cannot serve god and money others say you cannot serve god and mammon mammon is a generic term for basically just you know um uh like how things um, how things, you know, like like if you're if you're putting something ahead of God, 
okay that becomes an idol in your heart okay Matthew 6 24 no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve God and money and other translations use the term God and mammon and again mammon does not mean money mammon is more just like a, a generic term of um, I, I think it's translated money most of the time but in in most translations um, they just translate it God and money um, the NIV actually puts money in um, in uh, capital letters um, let me let me grab this really quick come on money um. So the money there is mammonas, the word there. And it means wealth, assets, money. Okay? And it's translated money to and wealth to. Okay? And so that's where they get the that's where they get you can't serve God and mammon or you can't serve God and money. It's basically it's it's if you're putting and and, and that and like while he's saying, you know, while the word there is saying wealth or assets, what could wealth be? Wealth could be anything, okay? Your your children can be a wealth, okay? Your family can be a wealth or an asset, okay? Your house, your possessions, all of that kind of stuff. If you're valuing these kind of things, okay, this kind of stuff, over God... This replaces God in your heart, okay? And that's what Jesus is saying here, okay? Is he saying, if you're putting your family members first in your life, first and foremost in your life, ahead of God and his will, you're not serving God. And you're not worthy of Jesus, okay? And that's really reinforced when the rich young man comes to Jesus nine chapters later and is like, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, do this. And he goes, I do that. What do I still lack? And then he goes, go and give all your possessions to the poor and then you'll have treasures in heaven and then come and follow me. Because what was he valuing? What was the rich young ruler valuing? Possessions, assets, wealth, money. And what did he do? He walked away from Jesus the true author and perfecter of our faith. He walked away. Why? Because he valued the stuff more than God. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Okay? It's if you're putting others, if you're putting people, assets, wealth, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you're putting that ahead of God, you're replacing God on the, on the pedestal of your heart. Okay? And, and I, I think I mentioned this once before, okay? I was trying to write a book at one point because I saw these commercials. I can't seem to find these commercials now. And I can't remember which insurance company it was, but there was some insurance company. And basically, you would see a, a house that was kind of upper middle class, okay? It was, you know, very beautiful, you know, you know probably two, maybe three stories tall, you know, 
lavishly decorated like you see in like a better homes and gardens or you know like a like a home and garden television or magnolia network style you know like decorating you know person came in and did something and then basically there was a there was a ring at the doorbell okay and sometimes it was a man sometimes it was a woman and they would walk up to the door and they would open up the door and there was a pedestal okay little column right there pedestal okay and they would they would look at that pedestal for a second they would go hmm and then they would grab that pedestal and they would heave it inside and they would and they would kind of make some room on a wall and then they would stick the pedestal up next to the wall then they would stand back and think for a minute and go ah and then they would start going around their house and they would start grabbing objects off of shelves photos of family you know um bank books um you know like i i think like like in, at one point a guy brought in his motorcycle and set it up on the pedestal and it got me thinking what's on your pedestal is it god where he truly belongs or are you putting other things on the pedestal because if you're putting other things on the pedestal like this commercial wants you to do that's your idol That's the point of this passage, Christy. Okay? Is is Jesus number 1 or is he number 2? And if he's number 2, he does you don't you're not setting him first. If he's number 2, you're idolizing someone else. You are not worshiping the true God of the universe. That's the point of this passage. Okay, and that's why he says, do not think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. And this is the problem with the postmodern hippie Jesus. Peace, love, and tolerance, man. She's believing in the postmodern hippie Jesus. Peace, love, and tolerance, man. That's not who Jesus ever was. And I can almost guarantee you Okay, then in the next four points, okay, you're probably going to see him driving out the money changers. Saying, do not, you know, you, you know, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made my father's house a den of robbers. Okay, she's going to be like, well, that's not very tolerant, peaceful. Yeah. How would you like it if people were running ransacking, th you know, through your house and like, conducting business duh jesus knew that his message was radical his he knew that his message would not be accepted by the masses he was essentially creating his his own apocalyptic cult uh that was kind of branching off of, of judaism no no he wasn't no he wasn't creating an apocalyptic cult okay See my deconversion zone video series, okay, for that, because I absolutely destroyed that, okay? He wasn't creating an apocalyptic doomsday cult. Stop that. That is absolute crap, Christy, and you fucking well know it, okay? I'm so sick and tired of the self righteous people standing there going, oh, you know, Jesus was just this, this doomsday prophet. No, he wasn't. He was the son of God, okay? And what he was doing was, is he was showing people how they could live. Because guess what? If he had ever bothered to read it, okay? These books, right here, okay? Genesis to Deuteronomy. Okay? First five books are known as the Book of the Law, also known as the five books of Moses because he wrote them. Okay? <clears throat> Over 640 separate commandments, not just the Ten Commandments, there were 630 plus others, okay, of what to do. Who kept them? Yeah, thought so. 
No one did. Not even today. We could go down just the Ten Commandments. Have you ever lied? Come on now, be honest with yourself. Otherwise you're lying. You ever stolen something? Even if it's small. Even if it's something that belonged to a family member. Have you ever looked at a person, man or a woman, with lust in your heart? Hmm? Come on. Be honest with yourself. And if you're honest with yourself, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart. And that's just three of the Ten Commandments. We've all broken God's law. That's the point, Christy. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 3 clearly states, okay, there is no one who does good, no, not one. Okay? What then? Are we Jews? This is Paul talking. Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and, Gen and Jews and Greeks, or Jews and Gentiles, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless, and no one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive, and the venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruins and misery, and the way of peace that they have known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. That is the first five books of Moses. So that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Okay? But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to, receive, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Okay. Moving forward to chapter, to chapter 6. Okay. What then? Are we, are we to sin because we are, we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the very, from the heart to understand, uh, sorry, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to that which you were committed and having been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness so now present yourselves as members present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification for when you were slaves of sin you were you were free in regard to righteousness but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death but now that you have become set free or sorry <clears throat> but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of god the fruit you get leads to sanctification and in its end eternal life for the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christy, we're all sinners, okay? But under Jesus, that no longer applies because we're saved. Yes, we're still going to sin. Yes, we're still going to have problems. But that doesn't mean that we get to that that 
we just get to run away from things or we get to go do something else, okay? The problem with Christy is that she doesn't seem to understand that the problem is sin, okay? It's sin, Christy. That's your problem. That's everybody's problem. And he knew that it would not be well received by those around him, Jew and Gentile alike. And so... Uh, so then why are there one, one billion Christians on the planet today? If it's not so well received? Come on, Christy. Use your head. That's not what he was talking about. <laughs> there are some people that want to stay slaves to sin. It's in Romans. Read the damn chapters. I'm so sick and tired of these biblically illiterate people who think that they know the Bible better than Christians do. Okay? That's why I keep asking, how sharp is your sword? Okay? It, it's, not, it's not that Jesus was like, Oh, everybody's going to hate the message that I bring. No. He was talking about... Okay? When he's talking about bringing a sword, he's saying that some of his words are going to set people against each other. Because some people are going to want to hear the message, and other people are not going to want to hear the message. People that don't want to hear the message... She doesn't want to hear the message. Why? Because she loves her sin. Okay? And she built up this straw man, postmodern hippie Jesus, peace, love, and tolerance man. And when she actually came in contact with the true biblical Jesus, she went, well, that doesn't fit my version of Jesus, so I'm going to deconstruct my faith. Like I said, parable of the sower. Read it. She's the one that received the word joyfully on the rocky soil, and when it grew up, it grew up fast and strong, but then when the suns beat down and the winds came up, it withered and died because it had no root. She didn't have actual faith. She just believed because she thought that's what she had to do. For a long time, I didn't know what it meant to be a Christian. For the first 17 years of my life, I thought I was a Christian. Okay? I really did. I thought I was a Christian. I went to church. Granted, I wasn't going every single Sunday, but I went to church, I went to youth groups, I went to all these different places, and, and, and all that time, until about 1995 or 96, okay, was never presented with a true gospel presentation, okay, of <clears throat> and what it meant to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I was like, what the hell is that? And I asked a bunch of people, like, what What do you mean by that? What does it mean to do that? And people told me. I ended up accepting Jesus, not knowing that I had accepted Jesus, okay, when I was 17. And it wasn't until a few years later, when I was in college, okay, and I, I was going to a church, and the pastor was talking about this he was talking about the gospel. He was talking about having Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. He was doing all of this stuff. And it hit me. I'm like, wait, was that what I did like a couple years ago? In my, in my backyard? Does that mean I'm a Christian? And so I went to the pastor and I said, I don't get this thing. Because nobody's ever explained this to me. Explain it to me, please. And he said, okay, here you go. And he explained it to me. I went... Oh, okay, I get it now. Nobody ever explained to me that that you have to accept Jesus into your heart. Nobody told me that. Okay, I never knew that. And so, the arrogance of this woman to sit there and think when she's living proof of this passage... That not everyone's going to accept the words of Jesus, okay? She's going to sit there and go, Well, he, he just knew that he was creating some apocalyptic death cult. No, he's not. You're just as bad as the conversion zone. And that's really saying something, Christy. 
For a supposed evangelical Christian, you have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Of course he knew that they would be, you know, persecuted for their beliefs, for following him. We already read that. Yes. Yes, it's earlier in the passage. Persecution will come. I am sending you out. As sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. You know what the funny thing is? <clears throat> if you go over to Acts, okay... And, um, let me see here. <sighs> so, in uh, Acts chapter 5, okay, um, Peter gets up and, and, basically lambasts they, they get they get arrested okay and the the guys are sitting there you know oh you shouldn't be preaching about this jesus fellow ah. and and peter basically you know comes up and is like yeah but you guys killed jesus and and you know you're the ones that that want us to not do this but we're gonna follow god not you <laughs> starting in verse um 33 when they heard this they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, the Pharisees, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis rode up, rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a member, um, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. And he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census, and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the presence, so in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might, you might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. That's the implication there um, at the end of verse 41. 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that, that the Christ is Jesus. He's literally doing it. He, he told them, what was going to happen, and when it happened to them, they rejoiced that they were being persecuted. Okay? Now, I'm not on that level. I'm not being beaten physically, okay? But just take a look at the comment section of every single video I post. Okay? Go take a look at all of the freaking things that I've posted. Okay? Just go look at my comment sections. Okay? I have people... Calling me names, ad hominem attacks, saying that I don't know anything, saying I'm I'm stupidly ignorant. I don't I don't know any. I've been called names. I've been called different things. It's what happens when you put yourself out on the internet like this. I totally expected it when I did it. Okay. And I defend myself as well as I'm able to. But this is the problem, Christy. Yes persecutions will come we live in a freaking fallen world do you not understand that go read genesis chapter 3 you apparently need to read your bible because you don't understand the concept of what sin is and what it does to people because the first two sins listed in the bible were rebellion against god which was the original sin and murder. Cain killed his brother over jealousy because God looked on favor of 
Abel's offering and not of Cain's offering because it was how they presented their offering. Abel came and was contrite and humble and lifted up his offering and Abel did that and, and Cain basically just like you know kind of walked over was like here and God was like yay good job Abel yeah well you just brought what you wanted and so Cain got angry and God was like do you not understand that that anger is going to get you in trouble son and Cain says to his brother Abel hey let's go take a walk out into the field and then Abel attacks him and kills him And then he comes back like all smug and self-satisfied. And what did God punish Cain with? A mark that he had to die of old age. He literally had to think about what he did for the rest of his life. That is the punishment for his sin. And the third sin, you could say, is lying. Am I my brother's keeper? He knew exactly what he did. He tried to lie to God to his face. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah. You killed him. That's the point, Christy. You need to learn what sin is. And that we live in a fallen freaking world. Let's go a little bit longer and then we'll call it an episode. For doing something very different and radical. To Jesus, this was not, you know, bringing a, a message of peace to the world so that all men can know it. To Jesus and his followers, it really seemed like this was more of a battle, a spiritual and earthly battle. They were waiting for the kingdom to come here on earth and they had to accomplish all that would be accomplished, including war and persecution and bloodshed before all of that could be done. War and bloodshed? The fuck are you talking about? Where is that in this? Huh? Where does Jesus say, when you go out, disciples, read read the entirety of chapter 10 and show me exactly where Jesus says, now, when I'm sending you out amongst all of these people, if they don't believe in me, kill them all! Ha <laughs> ha! Come on, show me! Chapter and verse, show me! Where does Jesus say that to his disciples? Come on, Christy! Show me. I'll give you a hint. It's not in the Bible. Because Jesus never said that. Yes, there is a spiritual battle going on. Hence the reason why you need the armor of God. Okay? There definitely is a spiritual battle going on. And that's why he sent them out to Israel first. Okay? Because... The Jews were under spiritual attack from within the country by their own spiritual leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, okay? And that's why he sent them out to Jerusalem first. That's why he sent them out in Israel. I mean, not, not Jerusalem, but Judea, okay? He sent them out to the houses of Israel because he was like, you guys need to do what we're doing, okay? Because this is something that needs to be done. Okay, and this is the idiocy of eisegesis. When a person like Christy Burke takes a passage like this, reads the word sword, and goes, Oh, see, I, I, I watched I watched Lord of the Rings. And what did they use swords in that movie for? Oh, I watched Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves. They used swords in that movie. What are swords used for? Oh, swords are used for killing and bloodshed. Oh, see, Jesus is saying that there's going to be a lot of killing and bloodshed. <coughs> where? Where does where does Jesus say that? <coughs> it's not in there, Christy. You won't find it anywhere. Okay? Because you're eisegeting into the text what you want it to say. 
Which is why I ask you Christians out there watching this video, how sharp is your sword? I'll ask it again. How sharp is your sword? You need to know this passage, okay? You need to understand this passage. And I'll recommend it again, okay? Because it definitely needs to happen. The Invisible War by Chip Ingram. If you're a Christian, read this book, okay? Because it perfectly breaks down all of the pieces of the armor of God, okay? And Chip does an excellent job, okay, of giving you real-world applications of what's going on in the Invisible War. Because this, right here, is part of the Invisible War. People like Christy Burke, people like Deconversion Zone, people like Inspiring Philosophy, all the atheists out there, it's all part of the same war, okay? And it is a spiritual battle. That's why Jesus said, I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. Because he knew, and even Paul knew, because Paul mentions everywhere that men love darkness more than the light. In fact, John chapter 1, we'll read this really quick, and then I got to get going, okay? But even in John chapter 1, okay, even the apostle John says it, okay? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him not a thing, made, not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light is shining in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all, men, that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory, glory as of the, the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For, his, for from his fullness we have, received grace, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Okay? Men love the darkness. People like Christie love the darkness. Okay? That's the point. We're all sinners. It's what we choose to do with that knowledge. That's the choice in front of you. Jesus and eternal life or sin, hell and damnation. And I know that doesn't seem like much of a, of a choice. But if you think of it in terms of the matrix, you have the red pill and the blue pill. So if you like things the way they are, if you, if you, if you like your sin, you're a blue pill. But if you want life, life everlasting, choose the red pill. Because that's the truth. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, drop a comment below. Let me know what you think of this series so far. And as we say, we will see you on the next one.